Hello, and welcome to today's Cybersecurity Summit Power Hour. My name is Rick. I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you are experiencing technical difficulties joining the WebEx session, please submit a question using the Q&A panel. During the presentation, all participants will remain in listen-only mode. And as a reminder, this event is being recorded for rebroadcast. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of each of today's presentations. We encourage you to submit written questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A panel at the bottom right of your screen. Please type your questions into the text field and hit send. Please keep the drop down as all panelists. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce Bradford Rand, CEO of the Cybersecurity Summit. Bradford, we have the floor. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Rick. Uh, we have a wonderful Power Hour security briefing today with some fantastic experts um, from the FBI, from Arctic Wool, from No Before. And we're going to end off with the Department of Homeland Security's Cyber Division, which is CISA. Um, by joining us for the entire uh, duration, you'll earn a CPE credit. You'll get that certificate emailed to you in roughly two days. And also, we always get this question a lot, will the slides be made available? Uh, yes, they will. And they'll be on CyberSummitUSA.com, along with the video of this presentation. So um, we are going to kick it off immediately. And I am uh, really honored to introduce uh, Sherwin Howard. Uh, he's been with the FBI for over 14 years fighting cyber crime. And he's going to give you our uh, morning security briefing. And again, thank you so much uh, for our friends out there in the Southwest and the Tola region for joining us. Without further ado, uh, Special Agent Sharon Howard from the FBI. Take it away, Sharon. Oh, thank you, Brad. For I'm gonna immediately bring up our next uh, expert. We have Tim McCullough. And uh, he is one of the pre-sales systems engineers with Arctic Wolf. And uh, he is going to be covering a whole wealth uh, of, of threats, the threat landscape, best practices, and so forth. Uh, Tim, can you hear us? And can we I, hear you? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes, you sound perfect. OK, I'm going to uh, pass off the stage to you, Tim. I well, appreciate that. You got it. Wow, Agent Howard's uh, presentation was very thorough, and I appreciate the content. Um, I will be able to answer some of the questions that came out later in after the Prezo. So um, uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and start. So my name is Tim McCulloch. I am a senior systems engineer for Arctic Wolf Networks. Arctic Wolf is a security operations company based out of Sunnyvale, California. Uh, we offer uh, managed detection response, as well as vulnerability managed risk, as well as cloud management, support broad, uh, broad visibility. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about everything that's happened, right, with COVID, uh, with the fact that companies had to shut down headquarters, offices, and now your workforce is immediately sprawled across the country or, or your region. And with that came some, you know, immediate challenges. So we're going to get into that. What you're going to see is you're going to see things that we're observing from our customer base. We have over 2,000 uh, customers around the globe that subscribe to our service. And these are the challenges that we're seeing and things that are happening in the market. We we'll also have a, have a set of references and referrals that you can look at that based on our, our data that we're going to present today. So let's go ahead and get started. So just quick agenda. We're going to talk about some of the remote workforce challenges and then go into emerging threats. A lot of it you saw earlier in Agent Howard's presentation. It was very good. And then some of the industry standard recommendations and then some of the things that we're going to recommend. And then one of the questions about work at home that is a great question. We're going to talk about that here towards the end. So let's go ahead and get started. So the remote worker challenges, I mean, no one could have forecasted a pandemic, right? I think this, this took all of us by surprise. Um, the problem was is the fact that we had to close businesses or physical offices, physical locations, and we had to expand quickly. What did this mean? This means stress on the infrastructure. You need more VPN licenses. You had to have a product, right? Um, I know that you know, talking to some folks from like CDW and SHI, you know, getting uh, laptops shipped because all of a sudden you turn from an office worker to a remote worker. I mean, things had to happen fast because you needed to keep levels of business continuity afloat while you're getting your workforce up. So 
Typically, when that situation happens, if you don't have a set of business resumption practices, you tend to have to just do what you can to get the business run. And because of that, lack of IT and security policy procedures are followed. And the reason for that is you have to get the business running, right? So you have to do things that are outside the exception, you know, to get stuff running. So that happens and that becomes a big challenge. And with that, obviously, IT processes and resources, you know, everything's now focused on keeping the business afloat, you know, doing business as usual and getting people what they need to do their jobs. And, and sometimes that tends to be doing things that are what, what I would refer to as out of bounds. Um, we talked about the harbor resourcing and sourcing, but then the standard behavior of the employee, right? Think about the mental thing that's happened to all of us in that now we're working from home. At home, I mean, as much as I love working from home, there's distractions, things are happening. Kids are home now, learning at home. We're sharing, maybe sharing resources, which we shouldn't be, but things are changing. So normal behavior that'd be in the office is, is different than what it's, what's happening at the home front. So talk about that. So now with COVID-19, just as uh, we, we saw earlier, you know, we're seeing a ton of phishing and social uh, campaigns around COVID-19, whether it's malware, whether it's a, hey, we have a, we have a vaccine, submit Bitcoin. Uh, you're going to see examples of this and things you could do to, to help educate your end users not to, not to be a victim. Um, you know, we'll talk about the malware distribution. The business attack services, uh, BEC was mentioned, that is, that is growing twofold, unfortunately, and we need to make sure that Again, the levels of training we could do, like I know before, I'm glad they were on, they're going to be on the call here, they'll talk. You know, they're a very good source of getting that, that type of training out. Uh, sophisticated attacks, I mean, attackers are becoming smart. I mean, we just saw proof of that earlier. It's amazing the things that they're doing. And then increased, increased ATO, which is account, personal account takeover and credit stuff. And we're going to talk about that through the presentation. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So, you know, again, the format of the presentation is to talk about the example, and then you're going to see a recommendation. And these are industry recommendations as well as our own, so we're going to talk through this. Um, so uh, spear phishing and phishing in general, right? Uh, what we're seeing is a large target of IT operations and HR, right? These are people that the attackers know hold keys to the kingdom, and they're notorious for doing transactions in email, right? A lot of business workflows done through email. And so sometimes if you're not aware of what's being sent to you and you think it looks like a trusted source, things happen. People click on stuff. We're human beings. So the problem with that is, you know, it causes, it's just, it, what you're doing is you're just feeding the beast, essentially, right? So you're clicking on the link, out goes a phishing site, you put in some, you know, PII data or something that's critical to your business and you've been exposed. So what we have to do is educate our, our employee base. But the other, th other thing we could do is we can mark emails that come from the outside coming from the inside is external, right? That's something if you're using like a Mindcast or any kind of maybe email security tool that's doing that, great, you're already ahead of the curve. But a lot of people don't and we see folks falling for scams such as, hey, you've been disciplined or hey, you know, so-and-so needs a password reset, I forgot mine, send me yours, you know, that kind of situation. So these are very basic stuff, but they happen every day. We see it all the time. And so that means we need to get that level of education to the end user as well as earmark anything from the outside in as external. That way, they second guess the note, right? Then we're seeing, again, this is the exploit of COVID, unfortunately. So impersonation is all over the place. You're seeing emails on behalf of, for instance, I received an email from Chase Bank. I knew it was fraudulent because it went to an uh, account that I use for just general spam, but uh, it looked real, right? It looked real. If my parents were doing it, they'd probably click on it. And, and this is happening now with COVID. It's, got, it's coming from either the World Health or CDC or some public agency. And it's simple, right? What they're doing is they're simply spoofing your alias, right? They're basically going back and they're spamming your email address. So it looks like it's coming from something that's legit or it's coming from your company, right? So it's confusing. And, and basically, these are just simple SMTP things that are happening that people know about. And the way to avoid that is simply implementing an SPF, which is called the Center Policy Framework. And what this will do is this will help mitigate that potential use of Hello, which is an SMP command line that allows spammers to gain access to your email address and just send it on your behalf. So if you implement SPF, that's going to help you avoid that. Then we have the websites that are soliciting some type of donation, right? They, they claim to be legit. They're not legit. They're thieves, right? Essentially, they're impersonating the CDC, somewhat some known entity. And they're trying to solicit donations. But the key is, is Bitcoin, right? I mean, I mean, I, I always second guess a Bitcoin donation, especially with when you have other sites like Venmo, you could pay the, the banks itself, the money exchange. 
Bitcoin becomes a little suspicious unless you know that person. And, uh, you know, this is something that Mindcast identified. And again, this, the, the recommendation is just increase communication to your end users, right? That's going to help. Hey, these things are out here. Don't fall for it. These are things we see. Uh, if you click, there's these, the presentations will be made available. There's links there. You can actually issue blocks if you want for these aliases. But the problem with the attackers, they get sophisticated, right? They're going to do it, keep doing it from different uh, email aliases. So the best thing for you to do is communication to the end users and education. Then, of course, there's our malware, right? And by the way, your mobile devices are just as uh, you know, vulnerable as, as the desktops and laptops and BDI. And the reason why I say that is people download stuff, right? In the emails, there's attachments. Sometimes there's ways to secure that. But, you know, again, mistakes are made. But this is a case where a mobile app was used. And it, basically what it did was it, it was a ransom encrypted data. Encrypted the data. Uh, and it was called COVID lock deployment. So this is a basically it's using a legit iframe from a reputable source. So if you look at it, if you're looking like at World Meter to see the number of people infected with coronavirus, this is how they're getting you, right? So mobile device management is essential here, right? Or again, communication, reinforce the training, don't click on links, but it is happening not just to the end users' desktops or laptops, it's happening to the phones, it's happening to the iPads, it's happening to your Chromebooks. So you just, again, it's that level of education, but an MDM solution is key here because it'll help you avoid situations like this. Our mobile devices are our livelihood, right? We're on the road, we're talking, we have our own data on there. This would be a bad thing if something happens, you're compromised. Then we have the malware threats. And this is crazy because this is something that's been happening for a long time. Obviously, this is one where they're using ASIO Rolt, right? And they're exposing a two and a half year old Microsoft vulnerability just to execute the malware. And again, this is where if you had an established vulnerability management process, that's connected to a body like CIS, the Center for Internet Security, you'll be able to pick this stuff up as installed software. Hey, this is not good. This is a high risk. Let's go and remediate this. You'd be surprised how many people aren't checking their assets, right? Aren't looking at what's installed. They were, there was a mention earlier about PowerShell. That's right. PowerShell has variants out there. You're seeing a lot of them, right, uh, that are happening where they're malware and they're executing things like they could execute uh, command control up to the internet or they could execute, you know, copies or even data deletes or exfils, right? So these are important things to do, but vulnerability management is essential in security posture, right? We all know this. Some of us may have not have heard of it, but essentially what you're doing is, is you're basically checking to see where you sit from a security posture standpoint and where those improvements can be made and what are those critical things. Like I always tell people, you know, if you look at CIS and you go to the top five, if you do those things, you're going to be in good shape, right? Now, be nice to implement all 25. The top five is good, and we'll talk about CIS maybe at the end of the Q&A. Again, more emerging threats. This is uh, uh, malware. This, is a, this was used for DNS re redirection. We're going to talk about this, especially with home workers, right, about DNS redirection. So this is where a situation where, you know, the default Microsoft Connect test site was redirected to a fake uh, World, Health, World, World Health Organization COVID-19 application screen. And then what it did was essentially it stole data off the browser. Right, so again, the reinforcing security training, but the best, uh, uh, the best uh, defense here is to implement a secure DNS technology. And I'm gonna talk about this when it comes to the home user because it's something that I'm doing today. Okay, well, this makes sense, right? So if you think about it, if you look at the, inc the increase in open ports, especially since the start of pandemic, people had to open up uh, their, their network, right? We had to get people in the workforce, in their homes, and then more VPN connections. How about VDI, right? VDI is great, secure, but it requires ports. So we're seeing a ton of more open ports. And then with that, obviously, comes the increase of risk, right? So, you know, when we do our external internal scannings, we're picking stuff up that, you know, a, a very tired firewall admin might have said, hey, that shouldn't have been at any, any. We should have had that port blocked. Um, you know, again, as we're rushing to get things done, mistakes are being made. So the best thing to do is go back and recheck your work, right? But in this case, this is where having a vulnerability management practice, doing a change practice, review your firewalls. I mean, there was a question about VPN and, and all that stuff. And, you know, the best thing for you to do is it's got to be blocked at the network. You do not want to wait for these attacks to hit at the host because they become problematic. They're there. They've now infiltrated your network. So the best thing to do is to do these different practices like vulnerability management, external posture assessments, and firewall reviews. These will help you become safer as time comes on. 
We talked about BEC. We know about this. I spoke, I spoke about this earlier. Again, we're seeing a lot of this. And this is crazy where, you know, workflow for financial transactions, in my mind, shouldn't be email process. It should be a formalized process, especially over a given amount. For instance, I used to work for Aetna Healthcare, and I know when I ran uh, my, my department, you know, we, did, we had a workflow system through finance that was outside of email. Um, this is situations that we see time and time again where, you know, folks in HR or folks in payroll or somebody that has some type of financial authority, they get, they get you know, they get a BEC, right? And it looks legit and it looks like something they should respond to. And they do it and all of a sudden you're compromised. So again, this comes back to, you know, anytime it's monetary, don't take that outside of the normal email exchange, but also that external, you know, tag on emails from the outside, that's going to help. That's going to second guess someone says, this looks like CEO, but it doesn't because it says external. Why is he sending it from external? Call and verify. But again, it's having that procedure in place to verify, hey, so-and-so approved this. This is not right. Let's do this. All right, account takeover and credential stuffing, something we're seeing often and not, and it's unfortunate. But uh, um, what we're seeing is uh, we use that article of a company called SpyCloud. And what SpyCloud does is it buys lists off the dark web. And essentially what they're looking for is they're looking for anybody that has subscribed to sites that have been compromised where they've used their corporate credentials and their passwords are saved in plain text. And you'd be surprised at how many there are. So for instance, like when I talk to customers, we will do scans like this on their behalf and we'll give them the report, right? Sometimes it's a little sensitive data, but you never know when things are used. And with an end user, you know, you think about the mentality when they go in and, and create a new account. So you're inviting so-and-so for a barbecue, we use eBite. What happened to eBite a couple of years ago? They got compromised, right? They're not thinking about a new password. They're not using LastPass. They're not using anything like that. They're basically saying, oh, I know my password. Here's my password. Reuse, password reuse is what, 75% and greater? So you know they're using their corporate credentials. They're probably using the same password. They get compromised. What we're going to do is provide a report saying, hey, go do password resets and probably some end user training. But be honest with you, the best protection of this is honestly to ample 2FA or multi-factor and then monitor the accounts. Make sure that you know, throughout your security cadence that you're looking at logins, right? You're making sure there's no brute force or credential stuffing occurring. You could tell by based on pattern of the different accounts that are, are being, if they're being logged in multiple times, right? And then establish 24 by seven monitoring. This stuff, you know, the attackers don't sleep, right? It's neither should your security operations, right? They should always be on the glass watching this thing. You should have process and procedures in place that will help avoid situations like this. This is probably number two next to standard phishing that we're seeing in the environment today. So let's go to some recommendations. Uh, hopefully this helps with some of the questions that were asked earlier. But, you know, we talked about education and training and know before it's going to be on later. Maybe they'll talk about this. But communication, right, especially now, we need to keep training the people. People's mind, minds are, the not, are not the same when they're in the office. You know, there's a lot of people that are either been affected by this personally, financially, uh, you know, emotionally. So, you know, the communication of security posture, security training is a, is a must. Um, and again, that goes to don't click on things, right? We know about that. Um, you know, you also got to let folks know about these scams. A lot of the stuff's already on public sites. You could go to Mindcast site. You could go to Trustway. Any of these companies that, that do security for a living, they are broadcasting, hey, don't do this, right? This is happening. There's always a new type of uh, ATP that's out there that's being broadcasted out to the public. So Folks don't go for it, but just be in the know what's happening out there in the, in the ether. Uh, leverage VPN. I mean, hopefully you're doing that today. I can't tell you how much, you know, VPN is so important, right? You want that protected network. You want to, you don't want to be, you know, running your business over just open internet. Uh, maintain the vulnerability patch management process. And what we're talking about is, you know, constantly benchmarking. Right, making sure that you're in, you know, you're you're in the know what's happening. Use bodies like CIS that will help you with those benchmarks, and then remediate the criticals. Um, have a strong backup and DR policy. And when I say backup, encrypt your backups. Uh, we've had incidents here, especially in Arizona. We had a large school district that was compromised, and they're still back. You know, they're still recovering even after a year. Um, it was essentially, you know, make sure that you know your, you can, you can back your data up, your data is secure, but also encrypt it. That's going to give you that level, uh, extra level of protection. 25-7 monitoring of infrastructure as well as cloud services, right? We've expanded our business to the cloud. Guess what? The cloud's offering APIs and security for logons, for unauthorized access, for unauthorized deployments. 
ensure that you know what's happening, especially in the cloud. We're seeing a lot of cloud um, uh, compromise, so make sure you have your cloud services covered. And then monitor for account takeover, credential breaches, as well as implement some type of advanced threat detection response capabilities. And then again, it goes back to the end user. Keep IT healthy, right? We want IT healthy. Stay above on, on the patch management, and if you can, keep it well staffed. Now let's talk about Arctic Wolf recommendations. These are some really good things that you know, we talked about earlier. This is just summarizing, uh, but essentially with phishing and BEC, the external extension to inbound email subject lines, that's gonna help. Uh, the behaviors around you know, clicking links, uh, establish the procedures on how financial transactions should be done, and then enable S S F, um, excuse me, sender policy framework. With malware, you know, hopefully your vendor, your endpoint uh, prevention tools are installed, keep them updated, keep them healthy, and then again, benchmark, run your vulnerability software to ensure that it's updated and it's picking up any kind of unauthorized installed software. Uh, data privacy, you know, data on private computers, you do what you can. You know, if, if, if you, hopefully if you're allowing uh, BYOD, you have a procedure, maybe they're using VPN and, and data is not being shared to a local system, but keep that in mind, right? You don't want your data sitting on all these different home workstations because it's shared with kids, it's shared with family. You never know what happens. I know my parents click on everything that comes in their email, unfortunately, because I'm on the phone with them fixing it the next day. But, you know, keep that at a minimum. You know, keep, make sure your corporate computers are not intermixed with family members. Do not allow this, do not allow any sharing. Keep the data se section. We talked about that in cloud, app, uh, sanctioned on cloud apps. And then obviously increase the attack surface. Make sure you're doing your firewall reviews as well as your active directory reviews. You know, look at people that have elevated rights. Are they still here? Do they need to be here? Are this person, does, does he really need admin? He or she, pull them out. And again, just general infrastructure audit. This is really cool. Something I would, I would definitely encourage folks that are working from home. I'm doing this myself. This is great stuff. But from your home network, you know, we talked about the DNS issue with the, with the Microsoft test and uh, the uh, COVID trick. Uh, Use secure DNS, like quad nine, 9999. It works great. I pulled my uh, local ISP's internet resolution, uh, internet DNS, uh, excuse me, DNS address out and, and replaced with quad nine. It works great. And then what I do also is I added a guest Wi-Fi network and that's where my corporate device sits on, right? It still uses, you know, a WAP, it's a WAP keys and it's still secure, but it's seg segmented from my home network, right? It's segmented from my home devices my Alexa, anything else, right? So I know that I'm on that network. Use password managers like LastPass, right? LastPass is a great password manager because it allows you, you know, it tells you, it grades you. It says, hey, you're not sophisticated enough. You need to go make this really complex, but you should definitely leverage that for personal accounts. And then disposable email address, right? This is like private payments. Essentially, if you sit, you know, have a disposable email address for any new accounts, you know, if you think about it, this, this again, it, it limits the spam and the, the possibility of being fished. Again, with Arctic Wolf, what we do, guys, is we're 24 by 7. We're a security operations company. We help with your infrastructure work, work, workforce. We are threat hunting, threat management, as well as vulnerability management, and we're here to help. So I appreciate your time, and for that, any questions? So I'm seeing a uh, good question around Zoom. So concerning Zoom on personal device, if my work computer has VPN or Z factor, will the guest network still protect? So the, the whole point of the guest network is to have your corporate device separate from your personal computer. So yeah, I mean, if you're not bri if you're broadcasting, leveraging only your personal computer and it's making the connection through Zoom and you have VPN on your phone. I hope that helps. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I guess I'll turn this over to the committee. Thanks, Rich. Rick. All right, thank you very much, Tim.
Sorry for that. Bradford has actually just lost power. So we are going to continue on. Next up, we have Harry from No Before. Harry, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great, great. So I am just going to send it right on to you. Okay, great. And you're uh, on. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. This is um, going to build on, I think, uh, a lot of what you've already heard, um, the, some of the presentations that have been given, especially when we've been talking about the um, huge issue related to fishing that we're facing right now in COVID times. Um, what I'm going to be doing as we go through this, because we we are a company that focuses on fishing and training humans to help uh, help them make better security decisions with the things that land in their inbox or the the day to day um, activities that they're engaged in. I wanted to bring some clarity because we do hear all these stats and we we hear about the fact that there is more phishing going on now and there are more target attacks going on now uh, in the days of COVID than ever before. So I want to um, really start to solidify that, especially if you're doing phishing training campaigns right now and you're sending out phishing tests. So um, one of the things that I wanna give some numbers around is what you would expect your failure rates to be. And of course, anytime you are presented a number like that, the question that every executive starts to ask is um, what, what are my numbers and then how does that compare to with what others are seeing out there? Um, how does it compare with other people, other organizations that look like me? And so we're going to, to get into that um, just a little bit. So let, let's talk about what we're going to cover. Uh, first, the problem of phishing, of course. And then I'm going to provide some benchmark data from a study that we recently conducted across the uh, 33,000 now uh, client organizations that, that we have and uh, some of the ways that we, we've tracked the results of phishing campaigns over um, baseline time periods, three months, and then a year plus using the program. And then I'll give you some, some data by region real quick. We have time for it. And then uh, a couple actionable tips. Uh, we are in a compressed time frame, and so I may skip around a little bit depending on time, but uh, I want to maximize your value that you get out of this and make sure that we have some time for questions. So the first thing is that we know that, that phishing is the problem. That's already been, been hammered uh, time and time again, and it's because uh, of a couple things. Uh, one, and, and this is a, a model that most of us are familiar with, which is the, the cyber kill chain developed by Lockheed Martin. Um, but what organizations do is they're, they're trying to figure out how to, how to penetrate our organizations um, is they, they start off with reconnaissance and open source intelligence gathering, um, looking at uh, dark web dump, uh, data dumps like, uh, like you heard about uh, spoken already. Um, and then they figure out how to try to weaponize that. Now, right now, um, we're in a time where there's this global consciousness and, and, and concern around COVID-19. And so some of the reconnaissance can be skipped uh, and they can just jump on an emotional trigger and create some weaponization around that by sending a phishing email that's either going to do credential harvesting like we saw or try to implant some malware if you were to click on a link um, or lead to some other form of financially motivated um, phishing uh, attack uh, like a like a BEC attack. Um, now the the interesting thing is that when you get into BEC and other more targeted attacks that may not use links and just get the, the user on the other end to respond, um, many of these steps of the cyber kill chain get skipped because you're automatically moving from the, the weaponization uh, over to giving the criminal what they've asked for. So, so the, the act on objectives has already happened at that point. You've skipped a lot of the, the command and control and everything else. So BEC is becoming more and more powerful as we go. Um, and all of this really revolves around just the way that we humans work, our psychological levers 
the things that will cause us to lose the ability to think logically and will make us just take the action that the cyber criminal is hoping that we'll take. So as we think through that, let me get into the, the data that we've collected. Um, what we did is we looked across 17,000 of our organizations and what we wanted to, to dial into was organizations that were deploying phishing training the way that we would hope that they would, following best practices rather than just trying to, to check a, a box for compliance purposes, and then following best practices in a methodical way, which means not just sending a phishing email once a quarter or once a year and taking a metric, but actually uh, following a predetermined plan uh, with that and phishing at least once a month. And uh, we broke it out across 19 industries that we had access to data for um, and good uh, statistical representation across. And what we wanted to do, again, is we wanted to look at the baseline. So what happens with an organization that's never done any phishing training before? Um, and then move into uh, a phase two. What, what would the, uh, what we call fish prone percentage be for organizations that have been phishing their, their users, doing phishing testing uh, with their users uh, approximately every 30 days, and then look out a year and say, if you're following that type of systematic approach in behavior-based training, what would your fish prone percentage be at that one year plus time frame? And um, what we started to see is that when we get to baseline phishing tests, the numbers are pretty scary. Um, if you're in these, these buckets uh, that you see represented on screen, these are the riskiest organizations that we saw at a baseline uh, across the, the, the sizes as well. So healthcare and pharma, 44.7 uh, fish prone percentage if there's never been any training. If you're a medium-sized organization and you're construction, about half your people, and then large organizations in technology, um, which is scary, but we see the proof year after year or even day after day when it comes to data breaches that get publicized in the news, um, over 50% of, of people uh, are going to be susceptible to falling victim for a phishing attack. And uh, we can give you uh, access to the full report here because it has breakdowns, uh, of course, across all these different levels for all the different ways that we took the measurement. And, and here's just a a shot of that. Now, this is going to be hard for you to read, but the takeaway here, uh, given our time, is that uh, in aggregate, uh, the average fish prone percentage or propensity to fall for a fish, uh, if you've never done any type of training, is going to be close to 40 percent, 37.9 percent. And and so that's what you would expect. If you're not doing any fishing training, um, and it's, it's not really the likelihood uh, that the fish will be successful, it is that percentage of people within your organization will fall for it. Um, and so that's a, that's a sobering number, and it's a number that brings with it, I think, some responsibility to do something about it. Now, the encouraging thing is that when you decide to do something about it, you are going to see results. And, and uh, for those of you listening, yes, I work for a vendor that does fishing training, um, but this isn't unique to our fishing training. It, you could be doing this, as long as you're doing it in a well thought out, well crafted way that eliminates some of the blind spots. If you're using a competitor or if you're using a homegrown system and you're doing it well, you'll see the same results. So uh, I'm not claiming a lock on the truth here or a lock on the only way to do it. What I am doing though is saying, if you have the ability to do it, do it right and you'll see results. And so the, here's the good news. When you start behavior-based training and you start enforcing consistency around that, what you'll see is that within three months, you can slice that baseline number in half. Now, there are very few things that you can do on the training side of things that provide that kind of return within such a short time frame. And uh, there are very few decisions that you make 
when it comes to implementing uh, time, uh, focus, or money that provide that type of return within such a short time frame. And so what we know is that when you put in the work, when you put in the effort to do something about the problem of fishing, and you do it in a way that is informed, uh, rather than just trying to, to put a program out and hope for the best, then you'll see results that are extremely encouraging. And again, here, um, you've got the, the takeaways for your specific industry and the size of organization that you're in. So you can answer that critical question, uh, where am I? And what do other people that look like me, um, how would I expect them to do in the same thing? So that's a, that's a critical question that uh, other executives in your organization would ask. And then here's the, the really good news. When you have that consistency uh, throughout a one year plus time frame, that close to 40% gets brought all the way down to under 5%. Um, so you'll never get to zero in any type of human-based activity. Um, there's always considerations that will come up that will cause uh, um, some people to fall victim for phishing attacks. And that may be that, that you have new people that aren't trained yet. That may be that you have um, people who are just extremely stressed and distracted, people who are coming back from from leave, people who are working from home all of a sudden, and their environment has changed. Um, but uh, I think that we would all agree that moving from close to 40% to under 5%, that is an, an extreme value, and it reduces your exposure to risk. We're all working in a work from home environment now, so dogs are a thing, unfortunately. Um, all right, so here's the way that it looks uh, when you look at that over time, is you do start off in an absolutely horrible posi position, but when you put in the work uh, over that 12-month period, 12-month uh, plus, it's the consistency that brings the results. So um, here's my takeaway for you right now. If you're doing fishing training, regardless of how you're doing it, what tool set you're doing it in, and you're only doing that once a year, um, or once a quarter, or even once every two months, um, or sporadically, um, and you're not seeing the results that you want, it is because there's an inherent flaw in the way that you're doing it. Um, and that flaw is, in the scenarios that I mentioned, it's because you're not doing frequent, it frequently enough. Um, you have to think about this like you're, you're training a, a muscle, uh, or you're training for a sport. If you wanted to get fit or lose weight, um, you don't just go to the gym once a year or once a quarter. All that is is an exercise in pain and shows you how bad you are. Uh, if you want to uh, lose weight or get fit or um, do anything that, that revolves around health and functionality, the only way to do it is consistency and increasing the, the frequency of it. Uh, if you want to build muscle, um, it, it's all around training consistently over time. Um, and, and so you have to, to really implement that in the way that you do all of, all of your training. Um, this is a behavior that you're trying to train. And so I always think about it like this. At, at every given moment, you're either increasing strength or you're allowing atrophy with these types of programs. So if you're not doing anything, all you're, all you're doing is allowing atrophy. If you're training once a quarter, it is um, you're, you're measuring a point in time and you're seeing how bad it is. You're not increasing anything. You're just taking the pulse and you're not doing anything to make it better. So the only, only way to make it better is to increase the frequency and increase the intentionality behind how you do it. So here's, here's what happens. Um, when you do a behavior-based approach, you, you see this you know, kind of 88 percent improvement. And I could pick out four other industries and the improvement rate is about the same, um, but we just wanted to start with, with some of those that were in that first bucket that I showed you. Um, we can also see that when you look at the, the aggregate, again, this is just reinforcing the point, I could pick any uh, of these sets of industries and I can show you that that 88% that improvement is pretty much a thing, because when you look at all of them in the aggregate, that uh, it comes down to that, that 87%. Um, 
And so this is, this is encouraging. Um, and again, it's not based on one specific product. It's based on the methodology. And so my encouragement, encouragement for you is that um, even if you're not a know before uh, customer, you can start seeing those kind of results. It's just based on the way that you do your implementation. So um, for those of you that are, are uh, dialed in from, from other regions or have uh, parts of your organization represented in other regions, we do have regional breakdown data as well, and that's available in the report. Um, I don't want to take up too much time uh, so that I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time and certainly the next speaker as well. So I don't want to go too far into that, but uh, I'll just give you some some glimpses of what we have to show you in the wider report when you download that. Um, and again, what you're seeing in these uh, is these these 80% uh, percent plus improvements in all these different regions. Some of these um, we didn't have enough data yet for, and so we're being transparent about that where we didn't have the data. Um, and then APAC right around 80%, but just under. So what do we do? Um, let, me, let me leave you with a couple tips, and these are mindset tips more than anything. Um, the first thing is to realize that our people are the critical fabric within our security programs. Uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, that I'm railing against technology. I'm just saying that technology in and of itself will never be 100% effective, the same way that people in and of themselves will never be 100% effective. These are, are layers that have to work with each other. And what we've seen over decades is that people will defer all of their security hopes and dreams to the technology and ignore the people. And that's a recipe for disaster, the same way as if we just gave it to all the people, it would be a recipe for disaster because there's a lot of blocking and tackling that technology is very effective with. Um, the other thing is when we've approached training as a, uh, as an industry for a long time and as a discipline for a long time, we, we've fallen victim to thinking that security awareness and security behavior are the same thing. And, and I'll tell you right now, if you're just giving information to people, you're not changing behavior. Um, traditional security awareness programs fail for what I, you know, fall uh, into um, this, this problem of thinking that if we give people information, we're naturally going to get the right desired actions and beliefs out of them. them. That's, that's just not the case. Uh, they don't account for what I call the knowledge intention behavior gap, which is uh, if I give somebody information, um, they may not care about it. Uh, and even if they understand all the information and have the intention to act on it, there are lots of things that we care about that we want to act on, and in the moment, we just don't. And the proof of that is in our failed New Year's resolutions that we all have every year, where we say we want to do all these things, we know the benefits of doing it, and we just don't because we make in the moment, in split second types of decisions that evaluate uh, and elevate one priority over the other priority. Here's, here's another problem that we have, um, is that there are three realities of security awareness that we have to wrestle with. And I'll, I'll leave us with this thought and then take some questions. First one is just because I'm aware doesn't mean that I'm, I care. Second is if we try to work against human nature, we will fail every single time. And the third one is that what our employees do is way more important than what they know. Um, and I'll say it as clearly as I can with that and then end off um, is that knowledge alone has never stopped an organization from having a breach. It's, it's behavior. It's how that person acts in the moment, regardless of whether they understand what they're doing or not. And so they'll either act in accordance with the knowledge that they, they know or in absence of knowledge, but it is the in the moment decision that matters. And that's why you want to train for the kind of the secure reflexes. You want to build muscle memory where it matters. And so it's all about having, you know, frequency and always doing 
the right thing, reinforcing with the right messages through different channels, but always having this pattern, as you see here, of constant, uh, as constant as possible, uh, social engineering testing and phishing testing. And with that, uh, I will turn it over for some questions. All right, thank you very much for that, Perry. First question we have here, how often should I be phishing my users in order to effectively train them? Yeah, um, this comes down to, to corporate culture, but as you heard me say, I'm an advocate for doing it as often as possible. Um, so at least every 30 days, uh, and if you can do it more than that, twice a month, then, then do it. If you have problem people, um, our tool, and I'm, I'm sure that some of the others will have ways to group those, those problem clickers into their own group and to test them more frequently until they have the ref reflexes that you're looking for. Great. Okay, next. What is the point of training if I can never get my fish prone percentage to 0%? It's, it's another layer. It's the, the, it, and, and asking that question would be like saying, what's the point of my email gateway if it's never going to stop 100% of, of phishing? Um, it's there because it provides a, uh, a fairly effective means of protection, but it's not 100%. Your firewall's not 100%, secure email gateway's not 100%, antivirus endpoint protection, they're not 100%, but they're all slowing down the ability and making it harder for the attacker to be successful. Great. And then now another question regarding employees. What should I do with employees that constantly fall, fail their training? Yeah, um, th that's an investigative procedure um, because sometimes you, we want to jump to the conclusion of this person is stupid or they don't care. Um, and sometimes that's true. Well, I don't want to say that people are stupid, but sometimes sometimes they just don't get it. Sometimes they have bad behavior patterns that they have to be trained out of and you build a custom plan for them. Um, but sometimes they're in impossible situations. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, there, somebody was telling me about one situation where they just could not get somebody to stop clicking. And it was actually a department uh, when they looked at it a little bit more closely. And it, on further investigation, they found out that the department was woefully understaffed and the people in the department had the explicit job of opening every attachment that came through because they were in recruiting and they had to constantly look at resumes that came in in different formats. And, and they had a uh, number that they were supposed to get through every day. So they had quotas, they had pressure, and they were understaffed. They were in an impossible situation. So you look at that, you can't blame the person so much as the system that they were placed in. So this is always a people process and technology thing. The people were in an impossible situation because the process was broken. Um, and the only way that you can fix that is to deal with one of those, or maybe you add a, a piece of technology in there like um, browser isolation or some other type of, of preventative measure that's going to help alleviate the um, the potential risk associated with the job that they've been placed in. Great, thank you. And then just one last question for you. Have you seen punitive training actions or positive training actions are more statistically successful? Um, statistically successful is uh, uh, something that, that I think provides some insight, but um, it depends on how you define success, right? Um, so I think you can get short-term gains with punitive, but you lose the long-term war. Um, so long-term war is one with rewards and relationship and building the program right. If you need short-term compliance, then you can build some punitives in, but in the long-term, you build more distrust and distaste for your program. So be really, really careful about how you use the stick and go for the carrot in the 90 to 95% of the time um, cases. All right, great. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Perry. Oh, and it looks like we just got Bradford back there. Hi, how are you? All right, thanks so much. Joining you from cyberspace. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. 
Uh, now we're going to bring on our closing speaker. And again, for staying with us the entire duration, you'll be getting your CPE credits. The slides will be shared. And um, we are going to roll right into our next speaker. Uh, Chad Adams is joining us from the Department of Homeland Security, the new division <laughs> called CISA, well, which he will certainly explain in detail, uh, as well as provide you with all of the tools that uh, are at your fingertips that have already been paid for by taxpayer money that are literally free for you to use to help protect your enterprise. Chad, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? And we can hear you. Okay. Great. Thank you, Chad, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You got it. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. I, I've presented at these uh, cybersecurity summits uh, in the past, and and uh, we have a lot to talk about. I'm going to be a, a little bit of a resounding board for some of the previous speakers um, because everything they said is is all part of creating a, a good cybersecurity culture within your organization. So you're going to probably hear me repeat a little bit of some of the things they said, probably not quite as in-depth as they did, but um, you're going to hear some of the same ideas, which is a good thing. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our role as the federal government, specifically the Department of Homeland Security, uh, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, um, how, how we look at cybersecurity, the things that we do. Um, we're going to look at some of the current threats, some of the current issues that are going on with, with all this telework and stay at home. I mean, as you can see, I'm, I'm at home myself. Uh, we're, we're not allowed to travel either at, at this point. So um, we're all facing new challenges and there's a lot of new things going on and we're, we're trying to respond to these, these changes um, while continue to keep the same level of security that we, we have in our offices and organizations. Um, and it's somewhat of a trial for people, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Then I'm going to also get in at the end of the, the presentation and talk specifically about some of the tools, some of the resources that we offer, being the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, um, some of the tools and, and things that your organizations can take advantage of um, at no cost to you, um, and they go right, around, right along with some of what the, the other um, presenters have, have spoke about. Um, that's the wrong way. So, um, you know, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about who we are, uh, some threats and trends, and some current things that are going on. A little bit about teleconference security, being that's a hot issue, hot topic right now. Supply chains always a hot topic, but but even more so now with with it being, uh, you know, uh, stressed a little bit. And then I'm going to close with some of our resources, which which aren't on the agenda. Um, so we're the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. We are the Department of Homeland Security, um, just about a, uh, recently, uh, we, we were called the De Department of Homeland Security National Programs and Protection Directorate, NPPD for short. Um, and within that, that directorate, you had groups called uh, the NCIC, um, US CERT. Um, you've probably heard these terms before. We are one of the biggest players or one of the bigger players within the federal space for cybersecurity. But we weren't well structured, we weren't well organized, and then we started kind of handling a lot of cybersecurity. We kind of started with infrastructure security, and then we got into cybersecurity um, and cyber infrastructure security, if you want to call it that. And so then we had to sort of rebrand, regroup, and, and change who we are. And out of that came an, an entire agency under the Department of Homeland Security that we call CISA, CISA. So, uh, when you hear the word CISA, that, that is us. That is the cybersecurity and infrastructure security uh, arm of the Department of Homeland Security, and that's specifically what we do. And within us, we have the cybersecurity division. We have the cybersecurity advisors, such as myself, which are subject matter type experts in cybersecurity. You have our infrastructure protection group. Though, uh, you have your protective security advisors. Um, those, those are the, the other side of the house as far as um, security advising goes. So that's who we are. Um, what role does CISA play specifically? And this slide kind of says it. We're, we're, we are kind of seen as the nation's risk manager. Um, where the FBI got on from a, from a, and they're another key federal uh, partner. And the FBI, um, they they come. They always do a fantastic inter, uh, presentation. I always love to hear their interviews. There are presentations and in their interviews. They they give um, 
great information on threat and, and current things that are happening, and it's great to see that. Not that we don't have some of that information, but theirs are just, just fantastic. Um, we're a little different than the FBI, where they're trying to, you know, determine what's going on, what crimes are being committed, and figure out how to uh, uh, resolve those crimes, uh, you, know, to, you know, catch whoever's doing it uh, from a law enforcement perspective most of the time. We are sort of on the other side of the house. We are on the preparation side of the house. We're looking at things like reducing risk, um, building resi resi resiliency, both uh, from an infrastructure and a cyber perspective. Um, we're, we're trying to look at pro being proactive and producing proactive cyber protections for organizations. We, um, and we're looking at infrastructure resiliency and um, and then our also our task is also to help uh, do protection of federal networks. Um, so who who exactly is it that we work with? Um, so we work with all 16 areas of critical infrastructure. Most organizations fall most organizations fall somewhere within these these areas. There's only a few that that I would say probably don't in some way. Um, you can see the list here, um, and we work specifically with with these these. Uh, these areas to help do all the things that we do um, from proactive cybersecurity uh, assessments, um, to technical and, and more policy governance based assessments, uh, best practices, uh, doing awareness and outreach activities such as presenting here at this particular meeting that we're, we're here at. So um, we've got the 16 areas of, of critical infrastructure. We also have been tasked to heavily help with elections infrastructure, obviously. And we're even helping with COVID type response. Some of the things we're doing around COVID specifically, we're working with the healthcare sector to ensure that the healthcare groups are getting what they need um, due to the attacks that are on a cyber, um, that are cyber focused to the healthcare industry with, with the, the scams and the things that might be going on from, from the healthcare groups, specifically your, your local um, hospital systems, um, primary care facilities, just things like that. The PSAs and the CSAs, such as myself, are, are actively interfacing with these, these groups within our, our sectors and our regions, and we're, we're trying to um, help shore up their um, cybersecurity, see what they need, um, and provide, um, provide the tools and resources we have to meet whatever needs we can in whatever, whatever fashion it might be. Um, so today's risk landscape, you know, we're going to look at things from a risk perspective. So, you know, America remains at risk, you know, and, and what threats are out there. And th there's a lot, right? There's, there's ongoing risk, there's ongoing threats. Some of these threats can move over from, and they can kind of combine. And I'll give you an example. Right now, obviously, pandemic is something that's going on. It's changed the way we do things. We're now all working from home, most of us, unless you're essential and, and still out in the the workforce, but um, we, um, we're we all working at home, so that's putting a lot of technological challenges on our cyber systems, right, especially for companies that didn't already have a robust tele telework scenario set up, such as VPNs or, or RDPs or, or however it is, whatever method you use to, to do your remote work. Um, there's some challenges that are going on with that, and the, the smaller the organization gets, the, the less they were probably prepared for this, um, this level and this length of, of, of a work from home scenario due to a pandemic. But then the problem is you have a pandemic and then, then you also have cyber threats coming from cyber attacks and, and malware and all the things that you heard from, from some of the other presenters and, and um, the FBI. They're taking and creating and running scams around and taking advantage of the current situation, the current landscape of the pandemic and they're helping that with the cyber attack methodology and, and creating a whole another level of of attacks and they're really challenging our, our organizations um, controls they have in place and their their peoples and their process the people assets their processes and policies that they have in place to try and deal with this stuff because we're kind of in a new territory right now and we're all kind of learning how to do it um, some are doing it very well some, you know, we're here to help, um, and that's where we are. We're about to get into the extreme weather area. Hurricane time is about to spin up. So not only are you going to have a pandemic, not only are you going to have malware and all these actors that are still uh, preying on, you know, opportunities, you, you're going to have 
victims, possibly, hopefully not, but you're going to have people that are having to, to weather through bad weather, such as hurricanes. And there, that creates a whole other landscape of, of threats for certain areas of the country. So this is where we're at. These are the things that CISA is doing every day. This is where we're working at. This is where we, we live and breathe. And, um, and, and so we take these real threats that in some ways are very physical threats, and they're all pushed back into a cyber, uh, a cyber focus to them. They, 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 they evolve into having some sort of cyber footprint to all of these, these risks. And people like myself and the cybersecurity division and the CSA group within the Department of Homeland Security CISA organization, we're, we're the ones that are on your front line trying to uh, um, figure out what we need to do with this and providing the resources back to, back to organizations such as the people you represent. Um, so moving on. So cyberspace, it's foundational to our world. Um, automation technology, network communications are increasingly essential. Um, they're not going anywhere. In fact, they're just going to get bigger and, and it's going to keep evolving. Um, the amount of information that we store is huge. And I, I think we just have to open our eyes and say cyber is the biggest, if not, it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest um, asset and threat at the same time we have in our country. And we have to, we have to realize that. We have to treat it as such. There's a vast interconnectedness of relationships and dependencies. For example, the government relies on the private sector as well as international and vice versa. So, you know, third party vendors are our are, 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 are relationship that is uh, many organizations rely on heavily is third parties, contractors, consultants, um, companies that are going to come out and do different types of cybersecurity services for you. For you. That's, a, that's a relationship and a dependency that you, that you rely on. And, and many times it can be a healthy relationship, but if not properly managed, it can be a, a a, a, a threat or it could be a, a opportunity, a, a vulnerability um, that you could have within your organization and then linkages between different organizations. So as a result, the country is dependent on their cyber security critical infrastructure, such as things like the power grid, obviously banking and financial systems. We, we know what happens when, when the stock market has a, has a problem, banks are no longer lending money, when interest rates do things, the price of oil, Everything is interconnected. Our whole world is interconnected. And part of that is, is it's all connected around cyber. Uh, telecommunications, you know, we would not even be working if we didn't have telecommunications operating properly. We need to be on this, this presentation right now, right? So all this stuff is very important, and we need to consider that and um, consider not just that, but the things around that make it work, which are our cyber systems. So how are you targeted? So specifically, how are you as an organization or a person working in an organization targeted? And this is a, um, this is a good slide. I, I think it does a good job of kind of showing a lot of ways that, that, that you could be targeted. And then some are probably being done more than, all, more than others. Social networking is up there at the top. Um, people don't really realize this, but social networking is one of the biggest um, ways that you're, you're targeted still, Facebook still. I mean, Facebook came out, what, 2004, 2005, still one of the biggest um, avenues, more users than anything else. You can find out anything you want from anybody. Got even got its own term, Facebook stalking. You can, you can find out anything about anybody on Facebook um, just by reading their, their posts, looking at their profiles. Um, and unfortunately, some people are savvy and know to turn privacy settings on, some don't, so you're able to see a lot of stuff. Uh, LinkedIn is sort of the same way. Um, LinkedIn is a great tool for staying in communication for the job, you know, for your job and for your career. But you got a lot of information on there, personal information that that people could use for identity theft scenarios. Um, the media, I don't talk too much about that. Conferences, there's some information that's exchanged at conferences, only conferences work. Uh, you know, job postings, you might be targeted for a job post, see who applies to a job so you might throw out a fake job post out see who applies to see you know to gather some information about certain types of people within an area that's a very big way um if you have your resume on a website or online or on your facebook account or something where it's more public but it's online people can get a lot of personal information from you organizational charts um, very 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 uh one of the number one tools um, people can get access into an organization and be able to see an organization chart. 
maybe they have it freely on their website. They can get sometimes get email addresses to send those uh, those, those fish emails to 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 try to introduce that malware to gain access to the organization. So organization charts number one. Um, you want to see who to who to send it to, where you should send it, who would be a likely target. Those that's a that's a great reconnaissance tool. So people are targeted that way. Trade associations people walk around get everybody's information. You so you know. Uh, you're just candidates for phished emails, um, phishing attempts, things like that. Travel, you know, your name is on different things as you travel, hotels, airplanes, um, you know, you're just going to different places. Uh, so that information, information moves around. So um, people can use it. And, you know, dumpster diving. Dumpster diving is still a thing. I, you know, it's, it's like you think this is going to go away at some point, but now you can still find, people still think, have things on paper and they still get thrown away and people can still find information out. Uh, maybe not as much as they once could, but it's still a way that, that people might be targeted. Um, so cybersecurity is critical. Um, this this slide, what we're really trying to say here is cybersecurity is in everything. It's it's not it's not just your, your systems specifically on your phone and on your on your your laptop here in front of you. It's smart cars. It's grid type manufactured buildings, smart connected buildings. It's medical devices. Yeah, I mean, healthcare, one of our biggest worries about healthcare, some of those devices are connected to the internet. You know, some of the medical, the newer medical devices, some of them are connected. And, you know, we're hoping the networks are configured appropriately through the healthcare providers. Um, we have smart everything, smart cars, smart machines. We, I mean, McDonald's is even, you know, creating a uh, kiosk and all this stuff to order food. I mean, even, even the fast food restaurant industry is, is going smart. Your house, you, you know, Alexa control anything in your house. You can tell it to turn anything on, turn anything off. Um, and that's all convenient, but but it's it's also all there's cybersecurity considerations around every bit of that. Um, who minds the shop? That's that's the question we ask. Who's who's watching these smart devices? Who's ensuring that they're running a pro, the, the way they need to? Who's ensuring that they have the controls in place so that other people can't get in and take advantage of these interconnected devices. Um, and so that's some of the things to think about as we start going into the next areas of, of uh, technology and cybersecurity specifically. There's, there's, cybersecurity is going to get more. There's going to be more cybersecurity, not less. So um, that's just a fact. And, and the other fact is organizations tend to, to invest less money in cybersecurity than they do other things, even though cybersecurity is one that's probably growing at a faster rate. It's just the way it is right now. So we have this chart that we'll talk to you a little bit about information technology versus operations technology. And when I when I say that information technology would be your group IT, um, which are your your um, your groups that handle the, the informational assets and the, the, the equipment and in, in your informational type equipment in your organization versus your operational equipment or your operational technology. We, we've got some comparison here that, that are a little eye-opening, and this is for organizations that might use IT and OT. Um, so things like antivirus and mobile code countermeasures and IT is common and widely used. People are typically using AV of some sort. Um, they're typically using some different controls. But operations technology, you can't take a SCADA system and just throw antivirus on it too easily. Um, it can be more difficult to deploy. You have to do it in a different way. It can be very expensive. I'm not going to read through all these. You can read these yourself. But there's there's some things. Uh, patching is one big deal, one big a big, big, huge thing. Keep your software up to date. Um, in IT, it can be regular. It can be scheduled. Hopefully, it's regularly scheduled and everybody ensures it's getting done. But from an OT perspective, you don't want to throw every patch that comes out on some of your operational technology equipment. Um, these are machines. These are different types of equipment. They're not computers. They're not always just a computer or an endpoint device. Sometimes these are machines that you don't want to mess up. You don't want them to start operating incorrectly. So you might not patch quickly, and therefore you're, you're creating vulnerabilities, you're introducing vulnerabilities, or you might even be um, contributing to vulnerability that the organization has. We've got things, talk, things we take consider change management. We consider uh, security awareness, availability, uh, the physical security. The physical security is the interesting one. That's the one that's typically pretty good on both sides. 
So, um, cause we, we always do a good job of physically securing our stuff. So somebody can't walk, walk over and steal it, you know, I'm, I'm, We'll be very really humorous, but you know we do a good job of that. We just don't do as good of a job with the cyber side of it, you know, um, which really more damage can probably as much damage at least can be done remotely uh, through the cyber side uh, as could be done through the physical side. So um, very interesting. It's just sometimes in our nature to e more more easily uh, protect it from a physical perspective. So with all that said, um, you know, what can we do? Um, so, so next, so teleconference security. Um, something very big right now, we're on a teleconference as we, as we speak here um, with, with our Cisco web client. So what, what should we be talking about in teleconference security if your organization is gonna be using teleconference? Um, I know there's a lot, of, a lot of software out there and as the government, I'm not supposed to to talk about one particular software versus another particular piece of software, but there's some software out there that is that is very good for doing um, teleconferences within your organization, and there's some that probably you, you've heard about that you might not want to, to use, um, or you might want to ensure that whatever you're using it for, it, it does fit your needs. Um, we have some tips that we've put together. Um, tip one, use only approved tools. In other words, if, if, if if you get invited to this meeting with XYZ software, um, and it's not one that you would normally use within your, 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 your environment and your IT staff hasn't approved it, you probably shouldn't install it because you can introduce vulnerabilities into your whole network by doing that. Um, and that's, these are remote act control type, type uh, software as well. So if it's a, uh, not a good piece of software, you, you can actually create problems, pretty big problems for your organization. Tip two, secure your meeting. So whenever you're going to do submit your meeting, and I'm going to talk specifically about the WebEx because we're on it right now. But if you, do, if you choose this platform to use, you need to make sure that you secure it. Consider your, consider your entities, invite only those who need to be here. Have a plan to terminate a meeting. Make sure you know how to terminate it. Make sure it can be terminated in the event that something happens um, that, that it needs to be stopped. Secure the private meetings, add passwords, um, you know, add, make sure the meeting is only able to be accessed from the time it starts to the time it ends. Uh, and control the attendees. Make sure if you see somebody here that shouldn't be there, that you kick them, you remove them, you can even ban them, do whatever you need to. There's a lot of controls made into some of these software. Make sure you learn how to use it and use it. Uh, tip three, secure your information. Manage your screen sharing, recording, and file sharing options. The um, worst thing that can happen would be somebody gets in and records everything of a private meeting that you really didn't want uh, people to know, and then that gets put out on the, the regular web, right? It was an internal meeting, it was recorded, and then dropped out with some information that you wouldn't want released. Um, make sure you secure it. Make sure that your screen sharing is set up. Make sure recording options are set appropriately. Sometimes I think just getting into the settings and ensure everything is the way it needs to be is what you need to do, and some people may not do that. Make sure you protect sensitive information. Um, don't overshare anything that doesn't need to be overshared. Don't put any sensitive information into the meeting if it doesn't need to be there. Um, that, that sort of thing. A tip four, secure yourself. Don't reveal information unintentionally. Um, you don't, people don't need to know you're, you're, you're operating from your house, from your location. They don't need to know where that is. Um, Consider your surroundings. Consider what is shown in your video screen if you're using video. Some clients have the ability to blur the background. That's always good. Um, they don't need to see things because you might not think about it this way, but you could look in the background and see things like pictures of family members. On you know, you could see maybe documents sitting on a desk that might have addresses or private or PII type information. Be careful with that um, when you're doing this. It's very easy not to not to, to, to mess up and and leave that stuff out. Um, make sure you consider your surroundings and, and take appropriate action. If you can use that blur function, I would highly suggest that if, if your software allows it. I don't think this Cisco allows it, but if certain software allows it, make, make sure you uh, blurring the, the surroundings where it just shows your face um, is a very good, very good feature. Um, check and update your home network. Um, most of the stuff is, is working over some sort of a uh, an encrypted connection or something like that. So um, you're probably okay, but obviously make sure your home network has some sort of firewall, even if it's just the, the home defense firewalls. 
Um, make sure you don't operate on a, a DMZ zone, something like that. Make sure you're operating under some sort of level of privacy for yourself. Just some tips for uh, securing teleconference security. Uh, as DHS, as CISO, we get a little bit into cyber supply chain. We even have a whole assessment where we come and look at your, your um, cyber supply chain. We just call it the external dependency assessment. I'll talk to you a little bit about that at the end of this presentation. Um, cybersecurity supply chain, people sometimes want to look at it as an IT problem, but it's not. It's, it's, it's a problem around vendor management sources. Um, it's a it's a it's a problem around you know having good policies, um, relationships formation, relationship governance between you and the third parties that you that you you have within your supply chain. So um, you need to take a look at these these risks. You need to look at your cyber cyber supply chain risk and make sure that you have a plan for each of those risks to mitigate them. Um, a lot of the breaches that have happened. So I'll talk about them happen because we don't we don't manage the supply chain probably as well as we should sometimes and a lot of medium and smaller organizations just don't have any idea what happens after they they contract with that party to do any type of cybersecurity management operations. Um, there should be a coordinated cooperative effort between you and that third party and there should be some level of governance and relationship management between you and the third party. Um, and cybersecurity is never a technology problem. You can throw, somebody said this earlier, you can throw as much equipment at a problem as you want, but you still always have the people that can make mistakes and have problems that can introduce vulnerabilities and threats. Your processes, that's your management and your policies and your procedures, those can always cause problems and knowledge. You know, you, you have to train, you have to have a level of knowledge of the organization, you have to be properly trained, um, and there has to be a level of excellence within your organization. And and no amount of technology you throw at something is going to solve the problem. Somebody said it before, you can't 100% solve a problem with, with technology. When we say technology, that's also when we're referring to controls. That Controls are the things you put in place from a technology perspective or even a people perspective. but um, but your technology controls can never just 100% solve, solve your cybersecurity um, threats and vulnerabilities that you have. So some cybersecurity supply chain attack examples. We have a couple that have happened. You might remember some of these. Um, these are what prompted us to create an assessment that we will conduct and facilitate for you free of charge. To look at your third party and how you handle third party vendors at, from a cybersecurity perspective. Uh, Target specifically, um, and then Equifax had had a had a problem. Target was a HVAC security. HVAC company had some information from Target, and uh, they were hacked. Target wasn't hacked, and Target didn't know too much about the HVAC um, control, the measures they had in place, and so they were some of their data was exposed. And I think we all know what happened. Millions, I think, people millions of people's information got got leaked out. Um, I've never heard of the Domino's Pizza one, but it looks like their database was hacked. Um, and so there's been some different, um, some different uh, removal of information from these, these organizations through third-party groups and, and, and third-party software providers. So be careful if you're using proprietary software um, information um, or you're using services and consulting services from third parties. Um, they're, they're, it's fine to use third parties. You just have to make sure you're managing and ensuring that they're doing what they need to be do, doing to keep you safe. Um, it is your duty to do that. You can't just assume they're going to do that. Um, even if they're contracted to keep your data safe, you can't assume they are. You have to you have to have somebody tasked to in your organization to ensure that 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 is being done. And all organizations are different. You might need multiple people. It just depends. Um, some of you may already be doing this, in fact. In a recent poll, over 50% of organizations have had a breach that was caused by one of their vendors. 50%. So in a poll we did, half of the organizations had some sort of breach and it was caused or partially caused by something that one of their vendors does. And I, and I would bet, I don't know this, but I would bet a lot of that's probably software based. So it's a company creating software or proprietary software for an organization. They didn't have the right controls in place, the right software controls in place. Um, and then there you go. Um, 
So what are the what are the threats that that cyber supply chain has? Um, software service providers and outside contractors. We talked about that. Mergers and acquisitions. So we didn't really. So if uh, if you start out with one company but they're acquired by another company, things can change. Maybe one company was doing a very good job for you, but you get bought out by a bigger company that has more lax um, cyber software um, controls, more more uh, protection on their side. And that merger or acquisition can then cause you new vulnerabilities from what you would consider the same software you've always had. Uh, physical components, hidden back doors, uh, hidden user accounts. Uh, a lot of software providers will, will, will put their own accounts into the software so that they have an ability into the software to do remote maintenance and things, and that's okay. But um, you need to at least know about them and make sure that they're being protected in the right way. Network services. You know, that's just, do they have different, a, a specific port, port they're running or, or a way to access your, your software, your equipment, something um, from, their, from their location? Um, and then the Internet of Things, um, this is the new stuff that's coming out. Um, these are appliances. These are more, um, not so much traditional, it's computers and services as it, as it is, but this is more um, devices that, that might sit. You might just have one little box, has just one little cable, so the Wi-Fi doesn't even know it's there, but people can remote access into that device very easily. Um, those are IoT things. You need to make sure that your security takes into account um, IoT type devices and that um, you know you prioritize um, security for those devices. Make sure that you're very clean. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the cybersecurity offerings. I'm not going to go too into too, too much of a detail on these. Um, feel free to reach out to your cybersecurity advisor. I am the cybersecurity advisor for the Southwest region. Um, we do have another South cybersecurity advisor down here. Um, just reach out if you have any interest. Um, we can, I can put you in contact with the right group anywhere in the United States, get you more information on any of these assessments if you have an interest in, in trying to get any of these done. We are doing them some of these on the Soon over a teleconference, um, and, and some of these, and we, we do facilitate them. Um, a lot of times, we would come out and sit down with you at your location and do these assessments. But COVID has changed things a little bit, so now we're we're able to conduct some of these uh, virtually. So just get back with us; we can talk about these. Um, so, from the cybersecurity evaluations, um, we have two types of assessments. We have more of a, a strategic level assessment. And we have more of a, a technical level assessment. Some of our technical assessments are things like our uh, penetration testing. We offer full blown penetration testing on site or remote or a combination. We do vulnerability scanning service, which is um, which is also called cyber hygiene. It's uh, external um, vulnerability scan only, no penetration. So we have a, a, a campaign where we can do that for you at no charge. We also have a phishing campaign. We heard a lot of conversation about phishing and phishing campaigns, and I know some of the, the previous uh, uh, vendors that, that presented on this um, group are doing these services as well. We do offer them as well. We have a whole group within DHS system that does these. Um, we can set you up for them. Our services, the, the biggest difference, they're not, they don't, they're not, they, they're of no charge. But sometimes some of our services have a bit of a wait time to them. So, to get specific wait times, how long it will take to get these services set up and started, um, just reach out. We can we can work with you to, to get that information for you. Some of our um, strategic type assessments are, are more of about are more they handle more about governance. You know, they look at things like policy, planning, framework adoption, things like that. We have a couple of assessments around those specifically. As you see under cybersecurity evaluations, we have our cyber resilience review, which which we call the CRR. That looks at your policy. That looks at your plan, that looks at your framework adoption, and we provide you back a nice PDF based report from DHS CISA. Uh, map back to the new cybersecurity framework to kind of show you what you look like on 10, 10 domains, 10 areas of, of, um, of areas of, of cybersecurity concern, things such as change management, asset management, configuration management, controls management. So we look at all those areas, provide you back a, a view of, of what you look like. We also have our cyber infrastructure survey. This is a much lighter assessment. It's a controls assessment. So we're looking at controls specific um, people, technology controls, um, 
So what we kind of get into with this is asking you some questions on you know, what controls you have in place. You have uh, other compensating controls in place if you don't. And then we provide you back a interactive planning dashboard from CISA, DHS that you can take and use for things like capacity planning. Um, you know, where do we go from here? What areas are we low? What areas are we high? And the other great thing about our assessment is not only do we give you back just straight up, you scored whatever, 50%. Well, we show you, you score 50% and here's what the rest of the country in your, in your um, domain, in your, in your critical infrastructure sector score. So if you're the healthcare sector, we might provide you back, here's the high, median, and low scores for that particular part of the assessment from the country. And we do that on both the CRR and the CIS. So sometimes it's good to know what we score and how well we do, but it's also good to say, well, what does that mean in comparison to everybody else? of like size organizations that have like budgets and in places of, of like like size as far as who you service and you know your your, your employees and things like that. So like size companies and organizations. So and we we collect that data, we protect that data for you, we provide that data back to you in a, in a report type format. And you're able to take and use that to to make good planning assumptions on on where to go with your other uh, with your with your money and time and resources you have to invest in that. Um, so the other other things we'll, we'll do, I'm just briefly, we have some response assistance. We do some on-site assistance. We can do some malware analysis for you. We can help with uh, incident response, or I'm sorry, incident coordination. If you have an incident that happens and you're reporting to the FBI, you're reporting to the law enforcement, DHS CISA can also assist in that. Um, sometimes provide information back, um, track type track the incidents, do malware analysis if you've got malware. We have resources to do all those types of activities. Um, like I said, I'm a cybersecurity advisor. Some of the things I do specifically is assessments. I work with group working, I do working group collaboration. We help work with best practices within the private and public and provide resources and, and point you back to places where you can get that information. And we also are your face if you need incident assistant coordination. So if you have an incident, we would be the ones that would come out on behalf of the assist us. Or, or communicate with you on the phone or email or however to, to help um, get you what you need on uh, which for those times of stress while we work with other federal partners and, and local. Um, protective security advisors are the other side of the house of our regionally deployed CISA staff. They also do assessments, but they do more of the physical side assessments. Um, they're an incident liaison between government and the private sector and they support um, national and special security events, you know, big events. Um, uh, you know that that happens within the areas. Um, they're they're typical for for those types of, of, of events, the, the special events and the activities that go on within our areas. So that's our area. If you need to come or reach out to any of these, if you want to find out any information about any of these assessments, reach out to some of these other groups that I talked a little. I know they're very brief, but I talked a little bit about. Um, just reach out to me. I'll be happy to. Show you, send you some information or put you in contact with the group that would handle that specific request and uh, just get you going down the right road within the, uh, the area of CISA and DHS to, uh, to help shore up your cybersecurity resiliency and hopefully hopefully get you on the proactive side of cybersecurity if we can uh, help assist you that. And then, the last, last slide I think I have in this deck is just to show you where our assessments fall. I said some are technical, some are strategic. This is where they fall. Our most technical assessment is our, is our penetration test, which is the risk and vulnerability assessment. And then our most strategic would be the cyber resilience review. That's obviously a very question answer based assessment. There's no technical part to it. It's about policies and procedures. And then we have some varying degrees um, between the two um, in the middle. So this just sort of summarizes the ones that I, I kind of hit on or most of the ones I hit on. Um, next so it's the assessment that is our supply chain assessment. It's it's pretty, it's very strategic in, in in format as well. So if you have any more questions on this, let me know. Um, we can send more information on any of these assessments and, and make sure you understand exactly what you would use each one for and how they how it works. This is my contact information, my email address, and phone number. Feel free to reach out, and I'll take any questions that you guys have. Okay. All right, can you hear me? Great. Thank you so much. Uh, what a robust uh, presentation, as, it, as, as always, with, with the DHS. And I think so few people, especially all the executives out there, don't know that you've got all these wonderful complementary tools and penetration testing that uh, 
that are at their fingertips. So it's great. Thank you for sharing your information. Well, here's our first question. When my agency gets CISA follow-up emails from our reporting, what types of incidents, campaigns is CISA most interested in to help with versus what do you expect uh, SOC or IR personnel can handle internally? Instant response. Um, what are you guys most interested in from? Uh, yeah, what are we interested in? So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have never been notified that we aren't interested in anything, to be honest. Um, you know, anything, obviously, nation state is, is a big deal to us being federal. Um, but anything that, that impacts critical infrastructure, especially if it comes from, say, nation state or organized crime, which organized crime is uh, the encryption, you know, encryption, malware, things like that. We are obviously very, very in, interested in finding that out because if you get it or you had it, um, other people within the, the country is, is bound to get it as well. And we, our NCIC, our National Communications Integration um, Center, is a, is a big watch desk. And that watch desk monitors all of these activities. And if I get reported something to me personally, I report it to the NCIC. The NCIC has um, people in their organization that are from the FBI, from the DOJ, from, from, um, from all of the different agencies, um, as well as the Department of Defense and the National Guard, and we maintain the situational awareness of, of what's going on in the country. And if some organization, like say a power company, gets gets malware, that's ransomware, and they're being asked for you know a lot of Bitcoin or whatever. We're we're interested in that because we want to know where did it come from, how can we prevent it, what variant was it, and then once we find out what it was, we can provide mitigation information. We can send that information directly to the, the energy company that was impacted, but also, we provide it back to say that the, elect, elect, the uh, electric ISAC, who will push it down to all the electric members within the, uh, the country, and they can start realizing that this is something that's being targeted, say, to election, I mean, to, uh, I'm sorry, energy um, organizations, and it will help prevent that in the future. Um, that's the plan. So we're interested in getting any information back and uh, um, versus what can you do? I mean, we provide uh, threat feeds. We provide we provide a ton of, of, of outsourced feed through the MSI SAC, through ourselves specifically. We provide a, a lot of information back that you can you can get on board with, and and all this stuff that we take in, we push back out. So we don't just take it in and keep it. We push it all back out to the country. Anybody that's affiliated working um, can, can stay um, up to date with. Threat, threat indicators, uh, signatures, things like that. So we do the best we can. Yeah. I'm sure you do. I'm sure you're going to hit with quite a bit these days. Uh, here's a question from Lucille. Uh, what type or size of organizations do you provide assessments and services for? Yeah, I always get at it. I always get that question. So I'm going to size. I've, I've, 50 to 100, just the large companies. I've done everything from from a from a town of 500 people. The town itself, Texas, to one of the largest retailers and manufa manufacturing retailers in the world. I personally have done that as a CSA, done services for them. So my answer to that is all sides, as long as you fall within the areas of critical infrastructure. Um, I did an assessment one time for a bank uh, out, out in the middle of West Texas. The town had 500 people. The bank couldn't have had more than a thousand accounts, maybe. And we we gave them a full gambit of assessments because they 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 are as important as anybody else. Uh, they don't have the footprint necessarily, but they are part of our our critical infrastructure at least in that area of the country for sure. Right. So um, now, how do we prioritize who gets first versus who gets second? That's 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 a whole other conversation. But will we help anybody? Absolutely. Everybody. Everybody. Everybody is in our eyes is equal, except we have to prioritize sometimes uh, based on biggest impact. So that, that's how we can. Totally understand. Okay. Well, I think that wraps it up. Uh, we uh, have certainly shared a lot of your information. Thank you so much. And of course, as always, your slides. Can, I answer, made, one of, uh, can I answer one more question somebody asked? Sure. Uh, of course. Michael asked, are, 
So yeah, the CISA assessments results protected under FOIA, which FOIA, if you don't know what that means, that's the Freedom of Information Act request, and this is important. If we come out and collect a bunch of PCI or critical infrastructure information from you, um, or information about how you do things cyberwise, you wouldn't want that to just be pulled away and 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 from somebody with the Freedom of Information Act request. So the answer, Michael, is yes. We have what's called the PCII Protection Program. So anytime we come out and take any information from you, all of your data is protected under that. It's, it's applied that protection that that's exempt from from FOIA requests, which you asked about. It's also exempt from the state sunshine laws, and all of your data is uh, secured to, by need to know. So only people that have PCI training and need to know. Um, I don't know about CBI. I, I don't think so. I haven't heard that that is. But if you go Google PCII protection DHS, you can we we have a whole web page about what it what that entails. So all of the data for these assessments, most of these assessments are protected under PCI. And if you have an interest in any of them, just ask that question and we will tell you what protections we will apply to the data we collect. All right. Thank you. Chad, thank you so much for joining us. Again, a great presentation as always. Thank you for sharing your tools. And uh, I will also get on the list to, of course, have my company also get assessed as well. So, so thanks for sure. Chad. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. You got a pleasure. So um, in terms of follow-up, what I'm going to share with everyone right now from Arctic Wolf, if you uh, have some interest there, I just shared it with all of the uh, all of the people that are still with us, how to follow up with Arctic Wolf. Regards from uh, No Before, Penny. I'm going to put that information up there as well. So you've got that. And our next uh, Power Hour will be, uh, actually, uh, in Southwest, it's going to be June 16th. But if you'd like to join us on June 9th, it'll be up on our website. Uh, you'll be also getting an entire uh, fresh new perspective of the latest threats that are facing, uh, you know, all of our companies for that point, for that matter. Uh, another interesting uh, aspect I could share with you: um, the Cybersecurity Summit also produces the Tech Expo job fairs. Uh, obviously, almost 40 million people have been laid off, and with that being said, we're going to provide some uh, great information here, and this is the links to Tech Expo USA and Tech Expo, which is our other company, provides complimentary job fairs, both virtual and live for cybersecurity, engineering, and defense industry professionals, mostly with an active security clearance. So those industries certainly are still recruiting. And our next job fair happens to be June 9th. That'll be a virtual event. And all of the information can be found at Tech Expo USA.com. I just shared with you the links there. And uh, thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, uh, nearly 600 uh, executives from the Southwest and, and Tola region joined us, and we really appreciate that. Most importantly, uh, we hope to see you in 2021 at our live events. You'll all be receiving a CPE credit for uh, joining us, and uh, we wish you uh, safety and health, and certainly, um, you know, securing your enterprises and your home offices. You take care, and we will see you at our next Power Hour on June 9th. Thank you.